Section Zero of A Pickle for the Knowing Ones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Melissa Marie. A Pickle for the Knowing Ones by Lord Timothy Dexter with an introductory preface by a distinguished citizen of Old Newbury. Section Zero. Preface. Timothy Dexter, the author of the following curious and unique production, entitled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, which is here reprinted verbatim et spellatum from the original edition, was born in Malden, January 22, 1747. Having served an apprenticeship with a leather dresser, he commenced business in Newburyport shortly after he was one and twenty, and being industrious and economical, he soon found himself in good circumstances. In the year 1770 he married, and receiving a considerable amount of money with his wife, he was thus put in possession of a moderate fortune. In 1776 he had for one of his apprentices the no less eccentric and afterwards the no less noted Jonathan Plumer, Jr., traveling preacher, physician, and poet as he was accustomed to style himself, and of whom we shall hereafter speak. In addition to his regular business of selling leather breeches, gloves, suitable for women's wear, etc., he engaged in commercial speculations and in various kinds of business, and was unusually successful. He traded with merchants and speculators in the then province of Maine, was engaged to some extent in the West India trade. He also purchased a large amount of what were called state securities, which were eventually redeemed at prices far exceeding their original cost. Some of his speculations in whalebone and warming pans are mentioned by himself on page 23 of this work. Thus, in various ways, he added to his property, and in a few years he became a wealthy man. With wealth came the desire of distinction." and as his vanity was inordinate, he spared no expense in obtaining the notoriety he sought. In the first place, he purchased an elegant house in High Street, Newburyport, and embellished it in his peculiar way. Minarets surmounted with golden balls were placed on the roof, a large gilt eagle was placed on the top, and a great variety of other ornaments. In front of his house and land, he caused to be erected between forty and fifty wooden statues, full length and larger than life. The principal arch stood directly in front of his door, and on this stood the figures of Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. There were also the statues of William Pitt, Franklin, Bonaparte, George IV, Lord Nelson, General Morgan, Corn Planter, an Indian chief, Jack Tar, traveling preacher, maternal affection, two grenadiers, four lions, and one lamb, and conspicuous among them were two images of Dexter himself, one of which held a label with the inscription, I am the first in the East, the first in the West, and the greatest philosopher in the Western world. In order that the interior of his house should correspond with the exterior, the most costly furniture was imported from France, and the walls hung with paintings brought from Holland and other parts of Europe. A library was also provided, but how large or valuable we are not able to say. An elegant coach with a span of beautiful cream-colored horses was procured, on which was painted his coat of arms, with the baronial supporters after the manner of the English nobility. With this equipage, he took the title of Lord Dexter, because, as he said, it was the voice of the people at large. He was sometimes called the Marquis of Newburyport. Having completed the embellishments of his house and gardens, Lord Dexter busied himself in receiving the visits of the crowds, who were drawn by curiosity to his house. His gardens were thrown open to their inspection, and he was liberal to all. The fame of his hospitality attracted as many visitors as the fame of his images. To gratify his vanity, he selected in imitation of European princes a poet laureate, this was no other than his former apprentice, Jonathan Plumer, Jr., a native of Newbury. They had once been associated as master and apprentice, but now stood in the relation of patron and poet. 
from the autobiography of Plumer, a very curious and scarce production of 244 pages, the following extract is taken, which may serve to give some idea of the versatility of his genius. I had, says he, some practice as a physician, and earned something with my pen, but for several years was obliged chiefly to follow various kinds of business accounted less honorable, viz. farming, repeating select passages from authors, selling halibut, sawing wood, selling books and ballads in the streets, serving as postboy, filling beds with straw, and wheeling them to the owners thereof, collecting rags, etc. He had previously served one or two campaigns as a soldier, and on his return from the wars he taught school for some time in New Hampshire. The ballads which he hawked about were generally his own composition, Every horrid accident, bloody murder, a shipwreck, or any other dreadful catastrophe was sure to be followed by a statement of the facts, a sermon, and a poem. In the capacity of ballad-maker and monger, he attracted the notice of Dexter, in whose service he entered for a small salary as poet laureate. He wore a livery, consisting of a black frock coat adorned with stars and fringes, a cocked hat and black breeches. He was crowned in the garden of his patron with a wreath of parsley instead of laurel, but this ceremony was interrupted before its completion by a mob of boys, and both patron and poet put to flight. One specimen of his laudatory verses may be seen on page 29 of this work, which will give the reader some idea of his qualifications for the office to which he was elected. How well he was satisfied with the praises of the poet, we are not informed, but feeling probably that no person but himself could do justice to the ideas which he wished to present to the public, he commenced writing for the press. Several of these effusions were printed in the newspapers. The larger part of them, written at different times, are embodied in the present work, a large edition of which was published by himself and given away. In this edition, not a stop or a mark was used in any line of his writings, but in the second edition, one entire page was filled with stops and marks, with a recommendation from the author to his readers to use them where they were wanted in the work, or in his own language. To pepper and salt it as they pleased. Dexter had two children, Samuel and Nancy, neither of whom was distinguished for a strength of intellect. The son was a dissipated prodigal and died young. The daughter, of whom mention is made by the father in the following pages, was married to Abraham Bishop of New Haven, who, we are informed, treated her with neglect and cruelty. A divorce followed, and she became intemperate, lost what little reason she had, and is still living a wretched object. Lord Dexter himself, if we may judge from his own writings and from what we have heard, was not happy in his domestic relations. He complains much of his wife, whom he calls the ghost, and charges the cause of his separation from her for thirteen years to his son, Bishop. His own temper was irascible, and several stories are told of the excesses into which it would sometimes lead him. He ordered his painter, Mr. Babson, to place the word Constitution on the scroll in the hand of the figure of Jefferson, which the latter, knowing the artist designed it to represent the Declaration of Independence, refused to do. Dexter was so incensed by this refusal that he went into the house and brought out a pistol, which he deliberately fired at the painter. But he was a poor shot, and the ball, missing its object, entered the side of the house. At another time, seeing a countryman, as he thought, rather impudently viewing his premises, he ordered his son to fire at the stranger. He refused to do so, when the father threatened to shoot him unless he complied. His son then obeyed. The stranger escaped unhurt, but entered a complaint, and Lord Timothy was, in consequence, sentenced to the House of Correction for several months. He went thither in his own coach, priding himself on being the first man who had been to the county house in his own carriage, drawn by two splendid horses. He soon grew tired, however, of his confinement, and procured a release, which it was said cost him a thousand dollars. The individual who exercised most influence over Dexter was a Negro woman named Lucy Lancaster, 
or as she was commonly called, Black Luce, a woman of uncommon strength of mind, great shrewdness, and remarkable for her powers of memory and knowledge of human nature, but as wicked as she was sagacious. She thought him an honest man and not so deficient in intellect as many people supposed, and attributed his eccentricities to an excess of animal spirits. This was probably to some extent true, though it is certain that other spirits contributed in no small degree to the excesses of his temper and the peculiarities of his taste. He was addicted to drunkenness, and with his son and other companions, kept up his revels in the best apartments of his house, by which in a very short time all his costly furniture was ruined or very much injured. Not insensible that he must share the common lot, Dexter, many years before his death, prepared himself a tomb. It was the basement story of his summer house, magnificently fitted and open to the light of day. His coffin, made of the best mahogany which he could find, superbly lined and adorned with silver handles, he kept in a room of the house and took great pleasure in exhibiting it to visitors. At other times it was locked up, Soon after his death apparatus was prepared, Dexter got up a mock funeral, which with all but his family and a few associates was to pass as real. Various people in the town were invited by card, who came and found the family clad in mourning, and preparations for the funeral going forward. The burial service was read by a wag, who then pronounced a bombastic eulogy upon the deceased. The mourners moved in procession to the tomb in the garden, the coffin was deposited, and they returned to the large hall where a sumptuous entertainment was provided. While the feast was going on, a loud noise attracted the guests to the kitchen where they beheld the arisen lord caning his wife for not having shed a tear during the ceremony. He entered the hall with the astonished mourners in high spirits, joined in the rout, threw money from the window to the crowd of boys, and expressed his satisfaction with everything except the indifference of his wife and the silence of the bells. Lord Dexter died at his house on the 26th of October, 1806, in his 60th year, and by direction of the Board of Health, his remains were interred in the common burying place. His grave is marked by a simple stone. The Dexter Mansion is yet standing and is a very fine tenement but retains few traces of the whims of its late proprietor. Of the images, upwards of forty in number, only the three presidents now remain, the others having been cast down by the resistless hand of time. Some of them were blown down in the Great Gale of September 1815 and were sold at auction. The cut fronting the biography gives a very excellent and faithful representation of Lord Dexter in his walking habits, and the likeness of the dog is equally perfect. The dog was perfectly black and the skin as entirely free from hair as that of an elephant. He differed as much from other dogs as did his master and his friend, the poet, differ from other people. The likenesses of all three were drawn with great accuracy by James Aiken, Esquire, now a resident of Philadelphia, and could the patron and the poet be seen in proper person, dressed in the costume of that day, they would be objects of great curiosity. But they are gone, and of each it may be truly said. We ne'er shall look upon his like again. End of section zero. Section 1 of A Pickle for the Knowing Ones by Timothy Dexter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Melissa Marie. Section 1. A Pickle for the Knowing Ones. To mankind at large the time has come at last, the great day of rejoicing. What is that? Why, I will tell you those three kings as raised. Raised, you mean, should know raised on the first royal arch in the world almost. Not quite, but very high up upon, so they are good mark to be seen, so the woman's like to see the front, and all people's loves to see them as the Quakers will come and peep slyly, and feel glad and say, How the thou, friend, Father George? 
Washington is in the centre, King Adams is at the right hand, the present king, at the left hand, Father George with his hat on the other hat of the middle king, with his sword, King Adams with his cane in a grand poster attitude, turning his face towards the first king as if they was on some politics. King, our present king, he is stands herring, being younger and very deaf, in short, being one great philosopher, looks well east and west and north and south, deaf and very deaf, the god of nature has done very much for our present king and all our former ones. They are all good, I want them to live for ever, and I believe they will, it is hard work to be a king. I say it is harder... Then tilling the ground, I know it is, for I find it's hard work to be a lord. I don't desire the sound, but to please the people at large. Let it go to break the way it does for assortment, to help a good life to call the six blainy gouty, dull frames like myself with the gout, and so on make merry a chaley Christian is for me only be honest, no matter what they worship, sun, moon, or stars, or their wife or miss, if honest, live for ever. Money won't get those figures so fast as I wish. I have sent to Leghorn for many Mr. Bower is one amongst others. I sent in the great Cretum. Those three kings are plain white colour at present. The royal arch and figures cost thirty-nine pound weight silver, the highest Calcutan order in the world, so it said by the knowing one. I have only four lions and one lamb up the spread eagle has been up three years upon the Copley. I have thirteen billars, front and strat row, for thirteen states when we begun three in the rear, fifteen foot high, four more on the grass, see two, the same half at the right of the grand arch, toe at the left wing, fifteen foot high, the arch seventeen foot high, the my house is three sorry upwards of two hundred ninety feet round the house. Nader has formed the ground equal to what you would wish for the art by man equal to a Solomon. The Honourable Jonathan Jackson, one of the first in this country for taste born. A great man by Nader, then the best learning. What sought me forward for my plan, having so grand spot the whole of the world? Can't exceed this to those that don't know. Would think I was like half the world, a liar. I have travelled good deal. But old steady men saith it is the first that it is the first best in this country and others country. I tell you this the truth, that none of you great men wouldn't be affronted at my precedence, and I spare no cost in the work. I have the temple of reason in my garden three years past, with a tome under it on the edge of the grass. See, it costs ninety-eight guineas beside the coffin, painted white inside and outside, touched with green. No bell trimmings, uncommon. Lock so I can take the key inside and high fireworks in the tome pipes and tobacco and a speaking trumpet and Bible to read and some good songs. What is a precedent answer? A king born party, the great, has as much power as a king and ought to have. And it is a massy he has for the good of mankind. He has as much power as any king. For great ways back there must be a head somewhere or the people is lost like wild geese when they lose the gander. Two-legged want a head, if four-legged both, and two-legged fowls the name of precedent, is to please the people at large, the sound south's best. Now in the south give way to the north, the north give way to the south, or by and by you will break what failures be wise on. Keep the links together, and if you can't agree, consolated to a kingly power, for you must keep together at the worst. Herit labours, ye less see, there is so many men wants to be the all officers and no soldiers. Poor king, every day wants a bone, some more than others. The king can't live without the field. We have had our turn, great good father Adam's turn, and turn about, rest easy. You all will be pleased with the present king, give time. All did I say, no, but the major part, four-fifths at least. Timothy Dexter
friends. Hear me, two grenadiers goes up in twenty days for the friends. I will tell the a type of mankind. What is that? Thirty five or thirty six years gone, a town called Nobre, all one the young outed states. Nobre people kept together quiet till the land growed strong. The farmers was twelve out of twenty. They wanted to have the officers in the country that aimed in the seaport, wanted to have them there garing. A rose grand warm fight they would in law they went to the journal court to be sought of finally they go there Ains answered the seaport called Newburyport six hundred acres of land out of thirty thousand acres of good land so much for mad people of learning makes them mad if they had kept together they would have been the second town in this state about half of boston now men mad to be in office it hurts the people at large like carrying the innocent lamb to the slaughter now it would done to divide the north from the south all one what i have laid down but now keep together it is like man and wife and trow love now going death in the grander you will souse the glory I say keep together, don't break the chain, renew brotherly love, never fade like my box in my garden, be one great family, give way to one another, those changes is the tide, high water and low water, high tides and low tides for my part, I have liked all the kings, all three, all our broken merchants, can't have babes of profit gone and till the ground go to work is all that has been to college go with slippers and promise to pay and never pay only with a lie i guess four fifths is college lant or development or pretended to be honest freemasons but are to the country forgive me for guessing i hope it is not so the land is for loaves and little fishes moses was but a man and aaron they had some devil like myself man is the same give him power i say the cloak cookment matters the worst of cheats we han't got only in port we are noted to be the first in the north sabbath day is not half enough night meetings it makes work for the doctors and nurses catching cold but them lives breed fast to make up for them that dies poor creatures i pity them so priest riding it is wicked to leave poor souls into the grave all our ministers are imported very good men foul of love of christ i keep them amit amen at present the young man that doth most all my carving, his work is much liked by our great men. I felt funny one day, I thought I would ask, said young men, where he was born. He said, nowhere. What is all that? Nowhere was your mother overshadowed. I says, my mother was, if I was to guess. No, I tell in no town born out on the water. I says, you beat me, and so we laughed, and it shook up the splain. Show him a crow's nest. He can carve one. A fine fellow. I showed had all marble if anybody could to me the prize. So I have sent for eight busts for kings and great men, and one lion and two greyhounds. I hope to hear in four days to all honest men." Timothy Dexter. Mr. Printer, I must go some photo. I have got one good pen. My fortune has been hard, very hard. That is, I have hard knocks on my head four different times from a boy to this day, twice taken up for being dead. Two beating was a lawyer. Then he was mad because the people at large declared me Lord Dexter, King of Chester. This at my country seat, twenty six miles from Enport, my place, there is the fist from salt water to Kennedy. This lawyer that browsed me was Judge Livermore. Son, Arthur, the same crater, borrowed two hundred dollars some months before this, and then owed me. He beat his benefactor. It has been my luck 
to be used ten times worse by them, I do for the most, for I have lost first and last as much as a ton of silver gross. My wife that was had four hundred watt of silver, Abraham Bishop, that married my dafter, ten years gone him, and she since. Then, and my son Samuel L. Dexter, upwards of seventeen thousand dollars, the rest by Hampshire, carnal by rogues, has Gawkby, second-handed priests, deacons, grunters, wimers, every foul minutes, a Sith or Christ, we must believe in Christ, oh, oh, Jesus will save us, I think sometimes the saving salt and smoke and salt Peter will in time be very dear if it is use, the more smoke or the priests will be out of work, little like fister fronts, I laid out a plan to have holidays, one day in ten, twenty-four years gone, I thought it would save the nation, great deal of money, sir, in one century. Then the priests would have time to stuttery, then hammer down smartly, make the sulphur smoke in the nostrils under the cloak of bread and wine. The hypocrites cloven foots, they do it to get power, to lie, and not be mistrusted. All wars, mostly by the surf, the broken merchants are fond of war, for they hunt nothing to lose, and the ministers in all wars... The case of God leave the divil out, when it is all divil, if you can bear the trouth, I will tell the trouth. Man is the best animal, and the worst all men are more or less the devil. But there is sit of odds some half, some three quarters, the other part beast of different kind of beasts, some one thing and some another, some like a dog, some like horses, some bear, some cat, some lion, some like owls, some a monkey, some wild cat, some lamb, some a dove, some a hog, some a ox, some a snake. I want desipons to be done away, but they won't never be as long as... Priest Ryden, what do the priest preach to the devil for all their harass, old and young, more or less the devil? I like to say so devil preaches to devils, rebuking sin, keep it up, 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 saith the hypocrites, mockers of God, habits and custom is the odds, odds makes the difference. I seize God in all places, the God of nature and all things. We live and move in God. He is the God of nature. All nature is God. Take one element from us, one of the four. Take the fire or the water or, or air or earth. We are gone, so we live in God. No, let us all be good children, do all things right, the strong must bear the infirmities of the wicked. Children, keep up tight laws, draw the reins, little harder, stop thieves as fast as you can. Bad trade showing nine numbers was wrought in twenty-three hours, when I had hold of the pen five hours and thirty-five minutes, assortment assortment is good in a shop. The price fixes their goods six days, then they open shop on Sundays to sell their goods. Some sets them off better than others, bollard. When a man is so weak, he won't do for a lawyer. Make a priest of him for a weak thing to go with weak things. The blind to lead the blind so they may fall into one ditch. And so they go through the world darkness. But foul people have opinion of their one, not one in twenty, as to this world goods. And so it is as to the other world to inquire. The way go to a friar. Our people, about the same thing only, call it something else. In rum of a king, call it precedent, but priests have money to save souls. I want to know what a soul is. I wish to see one. Not a gizzard, I think the soul is the thinking part. There is great minds and little minds, great souls and little souls, great minds and little minds, according to the hevde bodies that has the power of our bodies. The same mother and the same father and six children. How they will differ in looks, complexions and actions. Some for great things, some for little things. Something, now I say, 
I say my figures will pay interest money. Prove it first. Going over my bridge. Some more told than helping the market of the town. Leeting hoses. Tavern keepers custom the honour of the town. And myself. Timothy Dexter. One thing forder, I have been converted upwards thirty years, quite resigned for the day, the great day I wish the priest knowed as much as I think I do. Their hearts would leap up to glory to be so, raider for the first time of rejoicing, to go, to go, to be married, to what a fine widow with her lump, borning the lamps, trimmed with glory, the shaking quickers after they get converted and their sins washed away, they stay at home, and let those go unclean, and so it is much so with me, I stay at home, praying for thieves and rogues to be saved, day and night, praying for sinners, poor creatures, my housekeeper is in the dark, was then bad, crazy, to be saved, she says she has sinned against the Holy Ghost, I have asked her what is. She says it is something, but can't find out way. Sends for the priest, comes. What is the matter? Ghost. Ghost, dear sir. And the minister makes a prayer. The ghost went off mostly. Not all part. Stayed behind. She has been crazy ever since. The priest can't lay the serpent howl. Many nicknames, three things have so sayeth the preacher. Amen, amen, see farth I do. Now, Mr. Printer, sir, I was at now haven, seven years and seven months past a commencement. Degrees going on forty boys was tuck degrees to do good or not good. The old man with the hat on told them to study how men nater and walk as a band of brothers from that day. I thought that all those that was bout up to college, the meaning was to get there, living out of the Libyr, if the colleges was to continue one century, and keep up the game, reckon the cost of all from their cradle to twenty-two years old, all their fathers and gardenings to lay out one hundred years' interest, an interest upon interest, a tress guess at it, and cast it, see how many hundred thousand millions of dollars it would come to, to mad rogues and thieves, to plunder the labouring man that sweats to grit his bread, Good common laning is the best sum. Good books is best well understood. Be honest, don't be priest riding. It is a cheat. All be honest in all things, no fear. Let this go as you find it. My way, spelling how, is the strangest man. T. Dexter. For a mister, for a minister, to get the tone is a great pint. When I live in Hampshire, one now light, Babstis babbler sobed away, just finishing his sermon, he says, Oh, good Lord, I hope you will consider what foul hints I have given, and I will clear it up some time hence. I am much wore down now, the weather being very warm today, less bray, and so went on fire, fire and brimstone, and grunting and fiving, and tried to cry and snuffle and blow the skunk's horn, and some the old souls and young foals sought to crying. I took my hat and went out how mankind and womankind is imposed upon all over the world, more or less by priestcraft. Oh, for shame, oh, for shame. I pity them. Be honest. Do as you would wish others to do unto you in all things. Now fear of death. Amen. T. D. R. Fowder, what different woes we have of this world and the other world. Two good women lived in a town where I once lived. One was sick of a consumption, near death. Both belonged to the church, very honest. Only the well woman was weak in woes. And thing says unto the sick woman, I think you will see my husband. Dow tell him I and my son are graze very well, and we are all well. And the sow is picked and got seven pretty pigs. And fare you well, sister. This I believe is satin trow. And so fare thee well. I shall come again in little while. And foudermore, I am for some foul deceptions, but very foul, fouler than death. Praised craft is very good for what to make old women grunt and young children cry and old fowls fling snort or yes and break up ferramies down by untrouts lying and swearing to a lie stop i am a live old me i have heard your wicked stuff you have ingered my friends a plenty and if you don't stop 
I will call forth one Abraham Bishop to put Nicholas and all that tries to keep up lying. If there should be any such stuff in the land, church members pant to be fond of deception. They are perfect, but if there is any, put them with the tough born, the robege, pies on it, or that fair. Not wind or filth, go by the rackle breed, and was then toyed. I like to say, no shite stink, strong bread and wine, Master Bartle Howe, is the bowel. A black man, a friend to John Meckle, gentleman from a crow's nest, where now? Where ass, Cole? Cole ass, where? Where now? Where o' oh, yef somewhere? Dare oilin, now the engines live there, only that can't be, he was from hell, where his or was brother came from, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, a crow's nest or organ powder down. From the Museum of Timothy Dexter, Esquire. I me, the first lord in the United States of America, now of Newburyport, it is the voice of the people, and I can't help it, and so let it go. Now, as I must be lord, there will follow many more lords, pretty soon, for it don't hurt a cat, nor the mouse, nor the sun, nor the water, nor the air, then go in all in easy. Now bonds broken, all is well, all in love. Now I begin to lay the corner stone with great remembrance of my father, George Washington the Great, hero seventeen centuries past, before we found so good a father to his children, and no going to rest. Now to show my love to my father and great characters, I will show the world one of the great wonders of the world in fifteen months. If no man moiders me indoors or outdoors, such a museum on earth will announce, O Lord, thou knowest to be true, folder, hear me, good Lord, I am a-going to let all children know, now to see, good Lord, what has been in the world great ways back to own forefathers, not old Plymouth, but stop to Adam and Eve to show forty-five figures, two-legged and four-legged, because we can't do well without four-legged in the first place. They are our foul in the next place. To make out Dexter's mausoleum. I want four lions to defend those great and mystery men from east to west, from north to south, which now are at the places raised. The lamb is not ready, in short metre, if agreeable, I form a good and peaceable government on my land in Newburyport. Complete, I take three presidents, Hampshire, Governor, all to New York, and the great Mr. John Jay is one. That makes two in that state, the King of Great Britain, Mr. Pitt, Ralphus, King Cross, over to France, Louis the Sixteenth, and then the great Bonaparte, the great and their signature, Crowbiddy. I command pays and the greatest brotherly love, and not fade be linked together with that best of trow love, so as to govern all nations on the face of the globe. Not to tyrannise over them, but to put them to order if any despout shall arise as to boundaries or any matters of importance. It is left France and Great Britain and America to be settled. A Congress to be always in France, all despouts is to be there settled, and this may be done. This will bless powers, and then all wars done away. Therefore, I have the lamb to lay down with the lion. Now, this may be done if those three powers would agree to lay what is called devil one side, and not carry the gentleman pack horse any longer, but shake him off as dust on your feet and laugh at him. There is a great noise about a Tao legend crater. He says I am going to set say black devil there, stop. He would scare the woman so there would be no yows for the building. I should have to erect some now, one now I stop. Here I puts the devil long with the bull, for he is a bulling two-legged animal. Stop. Put him one side near Solomon, looking with Solomon to Lady Venus. Now stop. Wind up there is great odds in front. I will let you know the secret how. You may see the devil stand on your head before a locking glass and take a Bible into your bosom fast. Forty hours and look in the locking glass. There is no devil if. You don't see the old fellow, but I affirm you will see that old devil. Unto you all mankind come to my house to mock and sneer with you don't 
You laugh before God, or I mean your betters think the air power. Don't know thoughts and actions. Now I will tell you, good and bad, it is not polite to come to see what the bare walls keep of my ground. If you are gentlemen, you would stay away. When all is done in marble, I expect to go out myself to help. If those great men will send on their likeness all over the United States, I wish all the printers to give notice, if pleases to, inform by printing in the newspapers for the good of the hall of mankind. I wows to make my enemies grin in time like a cat over a hot pudding and go away and hang their heads down like a dog, bin after sheep. Guilty, stop, see I am afraid, I write, tow, hash my people, complain of back or spittle, max work to clean it up. In the woman's scowls, about it spit in their handkerchief, or not spit. At all, I must say something, or I should say nothing. Therefore, make some noise in the world when I get so owly to gnash my gums and grising for water, and that is salt water when brought, a young devil to bring it, and a scoyer to wait and tend on gentlemen, a black sawyer his breath smelt, was then Bramstone by far, but let the devil go into darkness, and tackled his due to descare mankind for a little while. This cloven foot is seen by some, but the trap will over the hall the devil in time. I pity this poor black man. I think his master wants purging a little to harbour, Mr. Devil." A most, but I did not say, let him run away, good nit. Mr. Devil, carry the sword and money with you. Take John Meckle, gentleman, good not. T. Dexter. End of section one. Section two of A Pickle for the Knowing Ones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Melissa Marie, A Pickle for the Knowing Ones by Timothy Dexter, Section 2. This Cometh Greeting Mr. Printers, the eye grint or the knowing one, says I ought to do as they do, to keep up cheats or the same thing, to set ones to deceive the eye grint, so we may cheat and likewise have wars and plunder. My wish is all liars may have their part of fire and brimstone in this world, or at least some part of it, or else the government is not good. It will want purging soon, if a lawyer is to waylay a man and browse him unmasly almost to death. A a citizen that pays twenty-four dollars for kerrigs and not more than one dollar a week to mint the highways and my being liberal is in part of this bloody affair no sowage would bait a man as i was baiting almost to death i did not know how these men came to keep say lawyer from quite killing of me till some time after three men saw the action of the bloody scene without massy and carried say dexter into the house son fonting or near to say and behold the awful sight blading and blind of one eye twelve browsings in two hours at least no laws in this part of the world for a man of money to live those i lend money to and a lawyer and others they yows me the worst it makes enemies then these rogues if there is any that call me a soul and pick a quarrel with me about my newspapers so as to pay the lawyer craft to make up the molten calf a molten calf not an ox no the town of chester has lost two hundred weight of siver at least i believe more money no they may have me in the town or a lawyer chose for yourselves my friends and fellow mortals pays be with you all amen selag finally brethren something more coming chester september twenty ninth seventeen ninety six timothy dexter for the impartial herald messrs blunt and march i say to whom it may concern to the majesty of the people of newburyport greeting it costs eight hundred dollars a year to support a watch in this town and your gentlemen's windows are broken fences pulled down and cellars broken open and much other misdemeanors done at night are the watch asleep or are they afraid to detect those who are guilty of such practices 
boast not of it if you call this liberty and equality. Newburyport has had the name of being a very civil, worthy place. It is a great pity some bad boys or young men should disgrace it. I hope our worthy and honourable rulers will bring those rude lads to see themselves, and lick the dust like serpents, and ask forgiveness of their betters, and do so no more but repent and live. Now, fellow citizens, is it wisdom, is it policy to use a man or men so shocking bad as to oblige them to leave the town where they paid one dollar a day to support government? A friend to good order, honor to whom it belongs, to great men a friend, to all good citizens and honest men, goodbye. Whereas many philosophers has judged or guessed at many things about this world and so on, now I suppose I may guess, as it is guessing times. I guess the world is one very large living creature, and always was, and always will be, without any end from everlasting to everlasting, and no end. What grows on this large creature is trees and many other things. In the room of hair the rocks is moulds. This is called land where the hair grows, the belly, the sea. All kinds of fish is the worms in the belly. This large body wants dressing to get our living of this creature, and by industry we get a living. We and all the animal creation is less than fleas in comparison on the back or belly of this very large, immense body. Among the hairs to work this great body is that of nature past finding out. All we know is we are here. We come into the world crying and go out groaning. Mankind is the master beast on the earth. In the sea, the whale is the head fish. The minim is the smallest fish. The great fish eat up the little ones, and so not only destroy one another, but they are master over the whole of beasts and fish, even over a lion. Therefore man is the masterly beast, and the worst of the whole. They know the most, and act the worst, according to what they know. Seeing mankind so bad by nature, I think when the candle goes out, men and women is done. They will lay as dirt or rocks till the great gun fires, and when that goes off, the gun will be so large that the gun will contain nine hundred million tons of the best of good powder. Then that will shake and bring all the bones together. Then the world will be to an end. All kinds of music will be going on. Funding systems will be laid aside. The melody will be very great. Now... Why can't you all believe the above written as well as many other things to be true, as well as what was set forth in the last sentinel concerning digging up a frog twenty-five feet below the surface, where it was most as hard as a rock? There was his shape, like taking a stone out of a rock. This is from a minister. Now why won't you believe me as well? Wonder of Wonders how great the soul is! Do not you all wonder and admire to see and behold and hear? Can you all believe half the truth and admire to hear the wonders how great the soul is? Only behold, past finding out. Only see how large the soul is, that if a man is drowned in the sea, what a great bubble comes up out of the top of the water the last of the man dying under water. This is wind. Is the soul that is the last to ascend out of the deep to glory? It is the breath from on high, doth go on high to glory. The bubble is the soul. A young fellow's for gunning for the good of bodies and souls. My friends and fellow mortals, there is a first cause of all things most comely, so it came to pass that one Abraham Bishop got acquainted with my dafter, she a baby, he old in age and learning and college land and lawyer land and praise land and masonic land and devil land. He was then nothing as for cash, he being a fox and a old fox he was. After the grapes he tasted of them, he cried out for this and meal, sent my 
arrived after home, he said A. B. did not get all the loves and little fishes, but got a part. And now, nine years, I have now had my dafter crazy in and by the cause of this wild A and B hell on earth. Oh, oh, pity me. All good fellow mortals, said Crater, A. B. mad with learning, and as power as a snake and as proud as Lausfa, he said his father was worth twenty thousand dollars, and he was not more than five thousand dollars. He sent for Bishop Bass to be married before Dublest and insisted to be married, he says. Daxter may cry them down in the law region. After some time, they got published. Then he insisted not to have any witness, went and hid. Finally, my ghost, my wife, that was the ghost thirteen years last March. They were married. I was married to the ghost thirty-five last May. I have been in hell all the time more, so since Abraham Bishop got into my house, he hurt me and family one ton of silver. It was the cause of my parting with Miss Dexter. Now I am free, now for a wife that has a soul. The ghost was a gizzard and a cause all round her, a B striking my dafter on her side as she swears to great lawyer Dexter and to many others. I believe it that knows the trouth. The blow he gave her on the side, she had to put plasters on her side near three years. When liquor is in, the wit is scattered. A. B. is the base or creator, two-legged conicate, bowel, short neck, bowel head, thick, hairy, big shoulders, black, curly hair. He wants to be a god, but what I sought, said creator, down at short acquaintance. I can prove it myself, by men of the second magnitude, my guessing of the creator turned out, according to my guessing, and when I see my father, the great good man, Father Thomas Jeffsian, I will let the cat out of the bag and give light to the blind. Said A. B. will do for some office. Every animal will do for something. A. B. will make a middling good camp colomin, a thing higher if I am a rogue. In grain, so be it. A leopard can't alter her spots, nor Baver won't grow on a hook back. I believe if my father, the present, Cow the whole trouth of A B treatment to my dafter from her mouth, the great man will shed tears with grief, and all good people likewise. Shocking is the affair. I am Timothy Dexter. To mankind at large, I never have the honour to belong, I mean, to that honourable Masonic order. I note once. Once, twice, three times, and the ghost appeared, said, Thou shall not enter, because I have too much knowledge in my head. I suppose, had I been one, then should been to keep open doors for thieves and robbers. I have rogues plenty without keeping tavern. I don't want... No Abrahams, nor any of the order, only ficked ladies, married and great genteel men that belongs out of the town, married people and fine widows. I wish to see with pleasure, for I wants to marry a fine widow, for I han't had no wife for thirteen years. Next August, I gave the ghost four hundred weight of silver to quit the state, Great lawyer Passons, the giant of the law, wrote the contract. The cause of it was that Miss Dexter, that was, would have my dafter marry to a bishop. Cause the agreement, the sole cause, she had two trust days which have the money to deal out the interest, and she is so generous. She buys her needles, I buys the pins and scissors and all things else. She leaves the interest in the hands of the trust days. I must have a companion, sound good by all, at present with glory. Timothy Dexter I ask forgiveness of the world of mankind for telling the trouth. I may no hurt to a fly, only when he bites me then I kills the fly if I can. I have been my one trumpeter for teen years. My trumpeter is dead. My having so many wounds in face and on my head, I do it to make a good life, to keep my spirits from sinking. Pity me, all good people. Amen. 
and father. I married widder Frothingham. She had four children. The whole of all their stats was short of thirteen hundred dollars. This woman growed mad. She said she must go to hell, go ferting, for I have find against the Holy Ghost unpardonable sin. She was for making way with herself in three months. I got the best minister in town to lay the ghost. He prayed hearty, but could not lay the serpent, only in part. She has been crazy ever since. It is a wonder I am alive. Two children sucked her breast. It is hereditary. Two children married. Now live upon me. Being disordered, they bait me often with death club. And the old ghost too bad to say. I be silent under circumstances. I must cout and roam. So the one of the first places almost in the world, for I am in great fear of my life being taken away. Such blows I have had from two or three ghosts in my family is worth twelve hundred hoxits of jameta, best shogas, even a saxton to take the blows. I wouldn't for fifty million dollars. Words can't express the bloody war in my family. Three ghosts, all noise, robbing of me. I must sell with tears in my eyes. I can't see to write any more. Farewell, I say goodbye. T. Dexter How did Dexter make his money? Henry says, buying whale bones for stain for ships, engrossing 340 tons, bought all in Boston, Salem, and all in New York, undercover, openly told them for my ships. They all left, so I had at my one prize, I had four counting men for rowners. They sound the horn as I told them to act the fool. I was full of cash. I had nine ton of silver on hand at that time. All that time the creator's more or less laughing. It spread very fast. Here is the rub. In fifty days they smelt a rat. Found war it was gone to Newburyport. Speculators swarmed like hellhounds. To be short with it, I made seventy-five per cent one ton and half of silver. And over one more spect droll enough. I dreamed of warming pans, three knits that they would do in the West Ingers. I got not more than forty-two thousand, put them in nine vessel, four different ports that tucked good hold. I cleared seventy-nine per cent. The pans they made yews of them for coking. Very good, master, for coky. Blessed good indeed. Missy got nice, handed, now born my face, the best thing I ever see in born days. I found I was very lucky in speculation. I dreamed that the good book was run down in this country nine years gone, so low as half price, and dull at that. The Bible, I means. I had the ready cash by wholesale. I bought twelve per cent under half price. They cost forty-one cents. Each Bible's twenty-one thousand. I put them into twenty-one vessels for the West Indies and sent a text that all of them must have one Bible in every family, or if not, they would go to hell, and if they had done wicked, fly to the Bible and on their knees, and kiss the Bible three times and look up to heaven. Honest forgiveness, my captains all had complete orders, here comes the good luck I made, one hundred per cent, and little over then I found I had made money enough. I hadn't speculated since old times by government securities. I made or cleared $47,000. That is the old affair. Now I told thee all the secret. Now be still. Let me alone. Don't wonder no more how I got my money, boys. T. Dexter now, to all honest men, to pity me that I have been in hell thirty-five years in this world with the ghost, a woman I married and have two children now living. Abram Bishop married my doctor, since the trouble is such that words can't be expressed. Nine years disordered for a ton of silver for three months I could not have the ghost in my palace. Sleep not have to be had, now to save my life. 
I will sell. If not, I will let the house. It is as knotted as any house in the oil shells, and further in the wild or since Noah's Ark, and since the flood, taking in myself finally such a place. Nowhere in the world I'll go with it. Hoses, cherigs, all but plating gowls. A reserve, the Holy Bible, and one bulk more. My old head has wore out three bodies. It would take a journey of doctors. One hour to find and count the scars on my head, given by the ghost and others. Amen. June 12, 1805, Clane Trouth, T. Dexter. I say the great Mr. Dibble that has so many nicknames, a friend to the priests, now is dead all, and the Pope likewise, and the founders of Masonic, a cheap foul of war and greatness of hell, dead priests, dead, and lawyers, dammy, dead, Abraham B. by ass dead, and all the friends of mankind sings praises that we are the great family of mankind. Now out of hell, delir from fire and smoke, burning forever, now all in heaven upon earth. Now all friends, now for a day of rejoicing, all over the world as one great family, all nations to be united. No more wars for fifty years and longer. I recommend pace. A congress in France, and when we are ripe for a emperor in this country, call for me to take the helm, or a counsellor in the affair of Trouth. Amen and amen. Timothy Dexter P.S. One thing further, I happen not to think of that great creature, which some fools call the ghost, and others say that he is wanted. But I think that it will be of service to let the Thantron die. T. Dexter Scarding trouths, forty-six years gone, old French war to get men and lads to list. The price told them they would live as long as if they stayed at home, for every bullet had its commission from the Lord. He directed them one time when old good Mr. Emerson had a journeyman to preach. I heard him say, for Adam's sin, there was now in hell millions of millions of children, not more than a span long. All this is true, and when there was a drought, most over they would call a fast and pray very honest for the bottles of heaven to be uncorked, so the rain might come down. The minister did not say how large they were. I guess they held five hundred hocks at each. Eighteen o five, May twenty seven, Timothy Dexter. Trouth, I affirm, I am so much of a foul. The rogues want to get my jewels and loaves and little fishes without my lave. Lave is light. They all called me a foul forty years. Now I will call all fools, but honest men. Now to brove me a foul. I never could sing, nor play cards, nor dance, nor tell a long story, nor play on any musical, nor pray, nor make a pen when I was young. I could play on a Joe's harp. It would make my mouth water and the lady something water. Guess what I said? Nothing. A good laugh is better than crying. A clam will cry and water when they are out of their element, so we the same. If I had not the ghost in my house, I would, I mean, give light to my brothers and sisters and have a pace all over the world and bait the troth into my friends how good it is, how honest it would be, and how mankind has been imposed upon, and how they have been blinded with untrouths. Ghosts and Mr. Dibbles, there is now none of that order. All lie the Masonic if they wilt make a book of trouth. I will give the craters, but I will take the chair and put my friend Bonnie Party on my right hand and the great General Mero on my left hand. Enough to give the sword is in the banks. A emperor only be still. I will take the helm. In love I am a Quaker. No blood spilled, all in the love of a emperor. 
you will have in forty years. I may come back and see how you all go on and what you wear when the ghost is gone and Mr. Divil pays on earth before I will have a war in my day. I will be your friend, the Emperor, and if I want help I will call my friend Bonnie Party and George the Third and divide the lows. Now, take care, pays, I say, except of what is revealed to me, for it will come to pass. I was born when great powers rolled. I was born in 1747 January 22 on this day in the morning. A great snowstorm, the signs in the seventh house. Wives Mars came for Jupiter, stood by holding the candle. I was to be one great man. Mars got the best to be the honest man, to do good to my fellow mortals. I think I am a Quaker, but I have so little sense I can't to save. I can sweep my house and get all the no guilt and go out of hell. Is bless law and troth and reason on my side? It must be done. When I get my worthy widow, it is done. Not one word of anger as long as I live to a good woman, I affirm. Timothy Dexter Forder, I don't have any of the ladies of principle spend the interest I will spend day and night, all I have and do, all the good to plays. I can make as much heaven upon earth as possible, and then die in pace. Amen and amen for a companion I must have to make out this heaven. Then I am happy. The go in the dark in pace when the candle goes out in the Lord God of nature, one more amen. Goodbye, T. Dexter. Father, a great good man came to see me not long since I told said man I had many enemies. He says because you are too honest to be beloved, you don't gain in common ways with rogues. Bible, make a Masonic order to promise to pay, and never pay only with a lie, and gain heel on earth. Chate all you can, gain the mob, then you are a brother. Now I am glad I did not knock the doer down. My good luck, my God and my God, blessed be my good luck. T. Dexter Some more sweet mates and trouts, I say. No man sense, knower's ark, dare to write of so little learning. I begun when Abraham was in my house. I then wrote this world was hell and men was divils. Some better than others, some white divils, some black and some copper divils. I forgot them blow devils. This spread far was printed in many papers. A bishop caused my blood to boil thirteen years last March as when I begun to write. I say the great rogues was the best men. Oh, oh for shame, the honest man was laughed at. And A. B. being foul of learning, it makes him mad to be a lousefer. His reign is short. I hope to see my father, the great philosopher, the precedent before I die. The troth he must know. Amen. T. Dexter I cries, cries like a baby when I writes my trouble is so great to have my dafter so crazy. The rick of our lives, such blows with such weapons of a sudden and strike such roses, is worth thirty million of dollars for a poor man to have. And others, oh, browse me, they want my life to get my money and so I must seal and be a citizen of the world. It is a wonder I am alive. The birds will chip often before I can get to sleep. The noise is so great all hell. No more A. B. Bishops. He wants to be deity. Let's say based go once and twice act so no too much learning makes rogues and foals in the end dig a ditch and fall into it. White rope or a hairy rope takes them in time. Trouth. This is revealed to me how the world was made. With what stuff it was made with is the question. Now I tell the with paper, pen and ink and type the animals to be the founders of it with a lie. And lies upon lies, worse than beasts or snakes or woes or bars, tigers, devils and ten times worse with all lies and trouts. The world always was and is. Look out for troth. Amen. I, Timothy Dexter. Fodder in six days and very good and hard labour. I can't get my monument done in sixty days and work hard, very hard, and sweet it was for want of many hands. I had no Hiram, no Solomon, only myself. T. Dexter 
World makers mankind with marble and parchment and paper, pen and ink, and printers' tips and lies upon lies. Amen and amen. The world was made in six days out of nothing. Oh, yes. Oh, lie. No, all trow lie. Yes, all the world over. Timothy Dexter End of Section 2《3》of A Pickle for the Knowing Ones by Timothy Dexter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Melissa Marie. Section 3, Appendix. In honor of Timothy Dexter, Esquire. This great philosopher may indeed be styled a phenomenon in nature. The many literary qualifications he possesses rank him foremost among literary characters. That unequaled production from the pen of this wonderful philosopher, denominated a pickle for the knowing ones, has not only received universal applause and been ranked as of the first magnitude in the literary world, but has had such rapidity in its sale that a copy cannot be procured, though diligently sought after by men of the most transcendent merit. Where can we find a man so extensively useful and so eminently calculated to diffuse light to a dark and ignorant multitude as this rare philosopher? How penetrating his understanding! How deep his ideas! What a multitude of discoveries which before were hid in embryo have made their appearance at the nod of his genius. Surely we may say, blessed are the people who are highly favored with the greatest luminary that ever gave light to an existing world. While aiming at a just portrait of this remarkable naturalist and philosopher, his generosity is no less a subject of admiration than his literary and philosophical abilities. The readiness with which his benevolent soul bestows donations calls forth the grateful acknowledgment of all who have been liberally assisted from his bountiful hand. See him, the first to assist in building a church for the worship of God. See him liberally give for the purchase of bells the ready cash without hesitation. See him expending his fortune to preserve an everlasting remembrance, characters who have shown with unexampled greatness in Europe and America. Here the subject fails. Vain man may as well attempt to stop the course of nature as to do ample justice to this wonderful man. Behold, all nature stands aghast, to hear thy fame from east to west. How great, how grand of thee we hear, thou man of sense, thou eastern star! All men inquire, but few can tell, how thou in science doth excel. Great philosophic genius we, the meanest reptiles, bow the knee. At thy majestic shrine we shrink. What can we do, or say, or think, when contemplating on thy worth, which hath astonished all the earth? Great Dexter did the world do right. Thy name would shine with brilliant light. Each would declare thy wondrous fame and shout at Dexter's mighty name. Salem, June 14, 1805 My Lord Dexter, by the politeness of Mr. Emerson, I receive the very valuable contents of your package, a new edition of that unprecedented performance entitled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, etc., is very urgently called for by the friends of literature in this country and in England, and I presume with the additions and improvements intended to accompany the second edition, provided it should be well printed, would entitle the author to a seat with the disciples of Sir Joseph Banks, if not to a place in Bonaparte's Legion of Honour, for my Lord Dexter is an honourable man. But, sir, the work cannot be executed for the sum named, nor in the time specified. I will print an edition of five hundred copies with the additions for fifty dollars, and cannot possibly do them for less." 
wishing your lordship health in perpetuity, a continuance of your admirable reasoning faculties, good spirits, and an abundance of wealth, and finally, a safe passage over any river not with sticks, but a pleasure boat. I remain yours with the utmost profundity. W. Carleton The Right Honourable Lord Dexter, K.T. Newburyport The following pieces are not my writing, but very droll. Timothy Dexter Mr. Melcher, you're publishing the following extract from a letter said to be from a trader among the Indians to a friend may amuse some of your customers for the Gazette. A few days ago, one of the Indians paid me a visit. After some conversation, he said that a minister from the United States had been with his tribe to teach them the Christian religion. He says that there is but one only living and true God who is a good, wise, and powerful spirit. This Indians say, too and that there are three persons in the Godhead, of one substance and power. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That the Father is of none, neither begotten or proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son, and that the Holy Ghost visited a virgin and conveyed the Son into her, where he continued nine moons and then was born like other children, was born God and man, that when he was about thirty years old began to preach. But the great men no like his preaching sent their warriors who took and killed him. Indians ask what all this talk mean. He says that the first man and woman broke God's law in eating what God had forbidden, that therefore they and all the children that should proceed from them must die and be punished after death forever, that the Son came and died to save some of mankind from being punished after death, Oh, trained that man could kill God the Son, and that his death be of service to mankind. Great many people die before the Son of God, and did not know anything about him. It was then asked whether his dying would do poor Indians any good. He say yes, if they believe, then me say that Pabus no believe them, do no good. He say you must leave that with God and believe for yourself. One say it is hard to believe such Tories. If Indian tell such strange things, the white people no believe em. A curious sermon by the Reverend Mr. Hyberden, which he made at the request of certain thieves that robbed him on a hill near Hartlegrow in Hampshire, England, in their presence and at that instant. I greatly marvel that any man will disgrace thieving and think that the doers thereof are worthy of death, considering it as a thing that cometh near unto virtue, being used in all countries and allowed by God himself. The thing which I cannot compendiously show unto you at so short a warning and on so sharp an occasion— I must desire you, gentle audience of thieves, to take in good part what at this time cometh into my mind, not doubting but that you, through your good knowledge, are able to add much more unto it than this which I shall now offer unto you. First, fortitude and stoutness of courage, and also boldness of mind, is commended of some men to be a virtue, which, being granted, who is there, then, that will not judge thieves to be virtuous? For they are of all men the most stout and hardy, and the most void of fear. For thieving is a thing usual among all men, for not only you that are here present, but also many others in diverse places, both men, women, and children, rich and poor, are daily of the faculty, as the hangman at Newgate can testify, and that it is allowed of by God himself is evident from Scripture. For if you examine the whole course of the Bible, you will find that thieves have been beloved of God. For Jacob, when he came out of Mesopotamia, did steal his uncle Laban's kids. 
The same Jacob did also steal his brother Esau's blessing. And yet God said, I have chosen Jacob and refused Esau. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, did steal the Egyptians' jewels of silver and jewels of gold as God commanded them to do. David, in the days of Abiathar the high priest, came into the temple and stole the hallowed bread. And yet God said, David is a man after my own heart. Christ himself, when he was here on earth, did take an ass and colt that was none of his, and yet God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Thus you see that God delighted in thieves. But most of all, I marvel that men can despise thieves, whereas in many points you be like Christ himself. For Christ had no dwelling place, no more than you. Christ at length was caught, and so will you. He went to hell, and so will you. In this you differ from him, for he rose and went into heaven. So you will never do without God's great mercy, which God grant you. To whom, with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. From the Providence Phoenix of December 1804, Marquis of Newburyport. On Monday last arrived in this town the most noble and illustrious Lord Timothy Dexter of Newburyport, Massachusetts, who has, since his arrival, requested the publication of the following stanzas in this day's paper, as a humble tribute to the incomprehensible majesty of his name. While they serve as a brilliant specimen of the gifted talents and admirable sublimity of the laureate from whose pen they flowed, the virtuoso in genealogies and the worshippers of noble rank and boundless fortune may derive a rich and delicious satisfaction from the subject to which they are devoted. Advertisement Extra of the Celebrated Lord Dexter Lord Dexter is a man of fame, most celebrated is his name. More precious far than gold that's pure, Lord Dexter live forevermore. His noble house, it shines more bright than Lebanon's most pleasant height. Never was one who stepped therein who wanted to come out again. His house is filled with sweet perfumes. Rich furniture doth fill his rooms. Inside and out it is adorned, and on the top an eagle's formed. His house is white and trimmed with green, for many miles it can be seen. It shines as bright as any star, the fame of it has spread afar. Lord Dexter, thou, whose name alone shines brighter than King George's throne, thy name shall stand in books of fame, and princes shall his name proclaim. Lord Dexter hath a coach beside, in pomp and splendor he doth ride, the horses champ the silver bit and throw the foam around their feet. The images around him stand, for they were made by his command. Looking to see Lord Dexter come with fixed eyes, they see him home. Four lions stand to guard the door, with their mouths open to devour, all enemies who do disturb Lord Dexter or his shady grove. Lord Dexter, like King Solomon, hath gold and silver by the ton, and bells to churches he hath given to worship the great King of Heaven. His mighty deeds, they are so great, he's honoured both by church and state, and when he comes all must give way to let Lord Dexter bear the sway. When Dexter dies all things shall droop, Lord East, Lord West, Lord North shall stoop, and then Lord South with pomp shall come and bear his body to the tomb. His tomb most charming to behold, a thousand sweets it doth unfold. When Dexter dies shall willows weep, and mourning friends shall fill the street. May Washington immortal stand, may Jefferson by God's command support the right of all mankind, John Adams not a whit behind. America with all your host, Lord Dexter in a bumper toast, may he enjoy his life in peace, and when he's dead, his name not cease. In heaven may he always reign, for there's no sorrow, sin, nor pain, unto the world I leave the rest, for to pronounce Lord Dexter blessed.
A full page of punctuation, commas, semicolons, colons, question marks, exclamation points, apostrophe, period, dashes. Transcriber's note. The block of punctuation on a page by itself is inexplicably left unexplained in this edition. Dexter wrote before it in the second edition. For a Mr. Printer, the knowing ones, complain of my book, the first edition, had no stops. I put in enough here, and they may pepper and salt it as they please. End of section three. End of A Pickle for the Knowing Ones by Timothy Dexter.